Good to have you. Okay, those are the announcements. We're going to get started. Uh, we've checked in. We've prayed. We're going to take a look at the book of Ruth together this morning. I mentioned last week, uh, at the end of the book of Judges, uh, that the content was pretty heavy. Uh, and it, it's kind of difficult to be just bogged down by problems and difficulties. The book of Judges is filled with compromise and corruption and conflict and chaos and those kinds of things. And so today we're going to kind of come up for air, so to speak. We're going to rise to the surface here for a few minutes, uh, take, take a look at a different kind of book. It's a love story. Y'all ready for a love story? No, well, you're going to get one anyway, okay? It's going to be a love story. Now, there are still problems. There, there's problems, there's pain in every love story. You know that, I know that. But this book is about how God redeems or pulls out of their difficulty, two women especially. So this is the book of redemption. It's about two women, Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi. We're going to look at those two today. Ruth and her sister-in-law, and Orpah, not Oprah, uh, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, were all widows. These three women were widows. And Ruth was young, and she wanted to marry again. And so through Naomi, her mother-in-law, uh, God led these two women, Ruth and Naomi, to a new country, back to where Naomi came from. But for Ruth, it was a new culture, and there she found a new husband. So we're going to look at that story today. So these three women had their share of difficulties. They had some problems. Uh, and as I said, God redeemed them and set them free from their problems. We're going to tell you in just a moment what those difficulties were. But I want to take a look at a couple of big ideas regarding the book of Ruth before we continue on. First of all, the theme of the book of Ruth is redeeming love. Ultimately, it's God's redeeming love. And then Boaz... And in a lot of ways, Ruth as well. Boaz ended up to be Ruth's husband. We take, and there's a key verse, I kind of like this verse. Uh, Ruth 1.8, may the Lord deal kindly with you. And that's what Naomi wanted for uh, her daughters-in-law. And the daughters-in-law wanted that for themselves and for Naomi and others. And so that's a great verse. We also like to look at an entire book in 10 words or less. So here's a little summary. Loyal daughter-in-law pictures God's faithfulness, love, and care. If you capture that, you've captured the book of Ruth without a lot of the details that go into it. So we're going to look at some of those details. Now, we have a graphic every week that comes to us from Walk Through the Bible. You can see that there are two people in this house. This is a house of Boaz. And uh, these, and he's with his new wife, Ruth, and you can see that they're very much in love with each other. You see the little cupids and the hearts. Isn't that romantic and sweet? Yes, okay. They're in a house. What's on top of the house? What's on top of the house? It's a book. And it's functioning as a what? Roof. So it's the book of roof is what we're looking at today. Listen, they don't get any better. They don't get any better. The book of Ruth, yeah, down, right? Yeah. I didn't do this. I'm just, I'm just the piano player, right? All right. <laughs> so the book of Ruth opens with a series of decisions made by individuals and uh, some conditions that came out as a result of that were, that were very, not very pleasant. So let's jump into the book of Ruth here. Number one is this. God can redeem my crises. He can solve my problems. He can get me out of my jam. God is able to do that. <clears throat> Here's the first verse in the book of Ruth. It came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. Last week in the book of Judges, we learned that there was a cycle of uh, downward spiral as Israel abandoned the Lord and got into all sorts of trouble and consequences for their compromises and God raised up a leader that delivered them and that leader died and then Israel wandered and they went to a cycle again downwardly well what we're seeing here is a correlation between the judges and the famine because God warned the people of Israel if you wander from me 
If you compromise, if you sin, there will be consequences, and one of them will be famines. And so this book of Ruth is centered in the middle of one of these cycles that we looked at last week. Uh, it's a time generally throughout Israel, a time of apostasy where people have wandered from the faith. Uh, spiritual unfaithfulness, uh, physical warfare, cultural decline. Things are not going too well in that country. There's a lot of violence. There was moral decay and anarchy. And one of the consequences of all this corruption was there were famines. There was a famine in the land. And so we read about this family that was living in Bethlehem and how the, the head of the family, a man named Elimelech, and his wife Naomi and two sons, they decided to leave the promised land and go into, actually it was enemy territory where the Moabites lived in Moab because there was food. Shortly after they moved there, Elimelech died. Some commentators believe that's judgment from God because he was not trusting in God. He was taking matters into his own hand. I'm not going to go that far. I just don't know what the scriptures don't say. But I just want us to think about it as, as a possibility. So Elimelech died. Now his wife, Naomi, is a widow. And she's on her own, so she encourages her two daughters to get married, and they marry Moabite men, which God says you're not allowed to do. You're not allowed as Israelis or as Israelites to marry foreigners, and they did. And it was not long afterwards that uh, both of those men died. And so now we're left with three widows, all on their own, one in a foreign country, two in the country that they knew. And that's the first five verses of this book. In the first five verses, we have a famine. We have a family that has migrated into enemy territory. We have a funeral. We have two weddings. We have two more funerals. There's a lot of pain in the first five verses. A lot of difficulty, a lot of challenges. There's a lot packed in there. And then Naomi heard that the situation back home had improved, that God had visited the land, and the famine was over, and there was food available back in Bethlehem. And so the family, um, Naomi was going to head back home. And she told her two daughters-in-law, who were widowed, stay here in Moab, find another husband, and just move on, move forward. Uh, and one of the daughters-in-law said, okay, I'll stay here in Moab. And Ruth said, I'm going with you. Naomi, I'm going back, to, I'm going to Bethlehem with you. And we see this very well-known verse of scripture. Ruth said this to Naomi, where you go, I will go. And where you sleep, I will sleep. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there, I will be buried. Ruth is all in for the rest of her life. She's made a commitment to be with Naomi, and she heads back to Bethlehem with her. When Naomi arrives, the people in the community recognize her, and they're, they're excited to see her, and they welcome her back. And here is Naomi's response to her family and friends back in Bethlehem. They said, welcome, Naomi, and she, wrote, she responded, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant, Instead, call me Mara, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full. Listen, not full of food because there was a famine in the land. She went away with a full family. She came back bereaved. The three men in her life are dead and buried in a foreign country. She's all alone. The Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Naomi. Since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. You ever feel that way? Like God is taking me to the woodshed and I am getting hammered. I'm getting spanked. I'm getting disciplined. He's been very harsh, very disciplined, or very 
uh, strict with me. And maybe sometimes it feels like, you know, God is against you when you've not done anything wrong. Naomi, as far as we know, is innocent. She followed her husband's leadership and she paid a steep, heavy price for some of the decisions that he had made, like leaving the promised land and taking the situation into their own hands. So this woman, Naomi, comes back home three times bereaved. She's hurting. Uh, she's bitter. She's angry. Uh, she's just been devastated. And so Naomi and Ruth now are in a very difficult situation. No men in their lives to care for them. They have to start over from scratch. For Ruth, it's a brand new country, brand new culture. She doesn't know anything that's going on. How do we live here? What do we do? What is this about? But God is going to redeem these women from their crises. And that comes up in the next segment. We're going to see how God does this. We're going to see how God solves these problems that are very real for these uh, two women who have come back. So here's item number two. God can redeem my context. God can redeem my context. And what I mean by that is where you are right now in life is where you need to be for God to solve your problems. Let's take a look. Ruth left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. She happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now, Ruth and Naomi needed food. They didn't have anybody to provide for them. And so uh, the, God's people in the law, in the scriptures, were instructed to, when you, when you harvest your fields, don't wipe that place clean and take everything out. Don't harvest the edges and the corners of your fields so that the impoverished, the poor, or sojourners walking through the land, they'll at least have something to eat. Essentially what we're talking about are leftovers. Leave something out in the fields for those who are impoverished. That's what it means to glean. They're just walking through, Ruth is walking through the field, picking up what she can find. So the law of God instructs God's people to do this. Now, you may have seen Jewish people like this image here with the long curly sideburns. And what they're doing is they are not harvesting the edges and the corners of their hair. As a symbolic and a visual reminder, don't harvest the edges and the corners of your fields. Now, not very many people are Jewish people are farmers but they all can remember the poor. That's what these curly sideburns are all about, to remember the poor. That's a part of the culture that comes back from Old Testament days. It's just a new way to do the same thing. So now you know what those are about. So here's God working sovereignly for Ruth. She goes out, she finds a place to glean, in chapter 2, verse 3 says, she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz. And so this is God guiding her. This is God providing for her. This is God setting up the stage so that she can find a husband. And that's where this story is going. God sovereignly placed Ruth where she was, in a place where she would receive more than just leftovers because God is generous God is gracious and he wants to give us more than just enough to survive Jesus said give us today our daily bread that's all we need is daily bread but sometimes he says there's a little butter to go along with it okay you got manna you got quail pretty soon there's going to be milk and honey and grapes and figs and all those kinds of things God's generous he can afford it and he's going to be generous to Ruth now, Boaz owned this field, and he's watching his workers, and he notices this person gleaning along the edges. She catches his eye, and he takes an interest in her. Now, remember, uh, Bethlehem is a very small town. Uh, the, the Old Testament describes it as the smallest, too small to be, even, to be considered a clan 
of Judah, which if I remember correctly, is less than a thousand people living in a very small community. So it's a small town. Some of you are from small towns. You know what small towns are like. People talk. People talk. Everybody knows everybody's business. So word spread quickly about this new girl on the block. And Boaz said, who's, who's this? He wanted to know who this girl was. And he asked about this girl. And here's his response. Check this out. Here's the response. So he says, who's this young lady here harvesting or gleaning? The response is, she is the young Moabite woman who returned with Naomi from the land of Moab. And Boab goes, oh, okay, I know about her. I've heard about her, so this is the one that I've heard about. Boaz wants to meet her. <laughs> this, this gets a little bit creepy in our culture. Okay, ladies, you meet a guy, you got a little bit of interest in him, he's showing a little bit of interest in you, and in your very first conversation, he says this about you. This is what he said, very first words to Ruth. All that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me. And how you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. Would that creep you out? Like somebody knows your life story. First conversation, he just dumps it. Yeah, here's, this is your life. He knows everything about you. Um, you know, I thought about that for a little bit, and I think here's something that is how we can redeem a part of this, okay? If we're going to do some redeeming. Don't worry if people are talking about you. Don't worry about it. Because if you're living in integrity, and unless they're lying, the only thing they can say about you are good things. That's all Boaz mentioned. That's all we ever know about Ruth. Or the way, did you see this? The way that she helped other people? That's the story of her life. That's why she's in Bethlehem. She's there to help Naomi. So live in such a way that when people mention anything that you've done, they talk about the way that you've helped other people. It's not a bad legacy to have. And so when Boaz heard that Ruth was a, a young lady that helped others, he wanted to help her. He wanted to be generous, generous to her in return. So here's the point. Here's, here's an application for us. When you're where God wants you to be, um, and when you're doing what God wants you to do, he's going to take care of you. He's going to meet your needs. And he can even go above and beyond what you anticipate him to be doing for you. So Ruth went back home to Naomi, and she said, I met a guy. I met Boaz. And uh, we know that uh, Boaz liked Ruth. Uh, Naomi knew that. Be Boaz liked Ruth. She could tell by the conversation and the way that he had been treating Ruth. So Naomi said, let me tell you about a custom among our people. Let me tell you what your next step is going to be. And it's weird, <laughs> but it worked in that culture. It worked. Here's, here's the backdrop to this, this cultural behavior. A woman who was widowed before she had children, which is Ruth, uh, she was encouraged to marry her brother-in-law so that they could have children in honor of her first husband and raise up a family in honor of her first husband that would continue the husband's name and continue legally the husband's line. So uh, Naomi then told Ruth about another custom that will help you show Boaz that you're interested in this. Sounds a little creepy, but this is their culture. This is how they did things back then. And it worked. It worked. So Naomi is saying, Ruth, here's how to get this process moving. Here's how we go forward with this. Brings us to the next point. Number three is this. God can redeem others' counsel. Others' counsel. So here's what Ruth's mother-in-law is telling her. 
You want a husband? You want our needs to be met? You want God to be generous and kind and gracious and good? Uh, here's how it's done. Chapter 3, verse 4. When he lies down, you go back to the place where they're harvesting the grain. They're separating the grain from those stalks. Uh, they're preparing to, to pro they're processing it and they're going to store it. When he lies down there at the threshing place, you shall take notice of the place where he lies, where he's sleeping, and you shall go and uncover his feet. Let me just say, that's a euphemism. It's a figure of speech because it's more than just the feet. It goes up quite a bit. But they just kind of softened the language a little bit. She's supposed to strip this guy. Uncover everything. That's, that's, you can, you can check it out. I checked it very carefully. Man, that's what he's talking about. You shall go and uncover his feet and lie down. Hmm. Then he will tell you what you should do. Now listen very carefully. What Naomi is counseling Ruth to do, there is nothing immoral about it. There's nothing sexual about it because it's an outer coat or just a blanket that, that um, Boaz is wearing. There's nothing inappropriate. There's nothing immoral about this. It's strange, but this was their culture. This is what they did. This is how she was to properly show him that she's available for marriage. And it's like a little signal. You know, this is like a preview of coming attractions, so to speak. But right now there are boundaries. But I just want to let you know I'm interested in you if you're interested in me. A little different. Now Boaz received that message very clearly. And he did not pursue Ruth uh, for two reasons. First of all, he assumed that Ruth would want to marry somebody younger than him because he was older than her. We read this in chapter 3, verse 10. You have shown your last kindness, which is her gesture toward him, to be better than the first, which was the way that she was caring for Ruth, or before uh, Naomi. By not going after young men, whether rich, or the, or the poor or rich. That's the first reason. He assumed that she wanted to marry somebody younger. But here's a more important reason. Verse 12. Although it is true that I am a redeemer, Yet there is also a Redeemer more closely related than I. Now this brings us into what is called a kinsman Redeemer. Some of you know that phrase, and some of you uh, might not be familiar with it. Uh, a kinsman Redeemer is that close family member that a widow is to marry and have children to raise up a generation for her first husband. The person that marries that widow is called the kinsman redeemer. And it has to be the person who is most closely related to the widow's dead husband. Boaz said, yeah, I'm in line, but I'm not at the head of the line. I'm like number two. There's somebody who's in line in front of me, and I'm not going to pursue you because it's not the right thing to do. I'm going to honor God. I'm going to honor our tradition. I'm going to honor our culture. I'm going to honor God's word is what he was doing for the Jewish people. So he said there's a closer relative that he gets, <laughs> the Lloyd paraphrase, first dibs. And if he says no, then I'm in. I'll marry you. All right. Final point, number four. God can redeem others' culture. This is where everything comes together now. Based on what is happening there in Bethlehem. Ruth, Boaz, Naomi. Chapter 4, verse 10. A little bit of a backdrop. Boaz wants to marry Ruth, but he knows he can't. So he calls together the elders of the community and the closest relative uh, to Ruth's dead husband, who would be the first in line as a kinsman redeemer. He pulls them together at the gate of the city where these decisions, kinds of decisions are made, and they have a conversation about this. And Boaz says in verse, chapter 4, verse 10, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malone, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. 
Now, she's a Moabite, but she'd already married a Jew. So she's in. She's in the, the Jewish culture. She's in the Jewish family, and it's okay for her to marry a Jewish man. It's okay for a Jewish man to marry her because she's, she's in. And this is what Boaz wants to do. So he tells this group of men that he's called together, Elimelech has a piece of real estate that is being held by Naomi. And Naomi wants to sell it. And uh, the kinsman redeemer has the right of first refusal. He gets to say yes or no, I want this piece of property. Oh, and by the way, Ruth is a part of the package. You get the land, you get Ruth as well. Kinsman Redeemer says, I'm interested in the land, but if I marry this woman, it's going to jeopardize my inheritance. I think what he meant was my wife's going to kill me. Uh, I don't know if that's it or not. There, there could be some other possibilities, but for whatever reason it was, the closest Kinsman Redeemer said, I can't do this, and, I, and, I, and I, uh, I'm going to defer to Boaz. I'm going to let Boaz marry her. And he did. But they demonstrated their agreement in another very culturally strange way. And here's how they did it. Chapter 4, verse 7. This was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another. And this was the way of confirmation in Israel. It's like a shoe contract. Here's my shoe. Have a great marriage. Enjoy the property. What is with the sandal? Why, why did they do this? There's a very good reason for it. We take a look back in the book of Deuteronomy, and there's other places as well. It says this. Every place on which the sole of your foot steps shall be yours. The sandal symbolizes that the landowner wearing those sandals, walking on that land, because I'm walking on that, this land, this is my land. And so when he takes off one of the sandals that is associated with the land and he gives it to another person, they're saying, in this case, uh, this man never owned the property, but in a standard transaction, let's say I'm going to sell my house in the yard that comes with it. I would take off a shoe or a sandal and I would give it to the new buyer and I would say, I used to walk on this property with these shoes and wherever I walked was my property. But these are now your shoes and it's your property. So it's the symbol of ownership based on Deuteronomy and Joshua, a couple of other places. So that's how that culture worked. So both the property and Ruth are yours. And she was redeemed. And Ruth and Boaz got married. And they had children. And here's what the Gospel of Matthew tells us about uh, this, just a short little snippet from the genealogy. Salmon, there's a name for a kid. Salmon. Uh, fathered Boaz by, remember Rahab, the harlot? Yeah, this is, this is her. She had a son named Boaz. Boaz's mother was Rahab the harlot. Interesting. And they had a child named Obed when he married Ruth. And Obed had a son named Jesse. And Jesse had a son named David who was the king of Israel. So you see here in Matthew, Rahab and Ruth both Gentile, non-Jewish women in the line of Messiah, Jesus Christ, because the spiritual son of David is Jesus. And these women here are in the line of Messiah. There's a third non-Jewish woman who is an ancestor of Jesus as well. So that's what Ruth is about, showing how God can solve problems, and he can meet your needs in ways that you didn't anticipate. He can go above and beyond. And also this, I comment on this occasionally when I'll, 
when I'm doing a wedding or maybe even a funeral, the decisions that are being made, whatever, they may even seem to be minor decisions. Where you move, who you marry, where you go to school, it's going to have an impact on people living three or four or five generations from now. I think about when my dad's dad was killed in a trucking accident in Blyville, Arkansas, when my dad was four years old. If Grandpa Sam had not been killed by a, a train, uh, Grandma Beulah <laughs> would not have moved to the West Coast. She would not have got a job at China Lake Naval Weapons Center and uh, would not have had my father with her at that base and she would never have met my mother and I would not have been born. And so we've got all these decisions that are made in this life that affect generations that are not yet born. Super important that we be careful with the decisions that we make and ask God to guide us, God to lead us, God to help us. All right, here's our takeaway for this week. Jesus redeems all of my life, all of it. My life here on earth and my life to come eternally. Notice this, Titus chapter two, verse 14. Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good deeds. Here's the point. God has been good to us through Jesus, but we want to be good to honor him. We want to know how to live, how to live in a way that's going to please the Father. And Jesus makes that possible for us.